The scripture reading today is from Matthew uh, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. At once the one who had received the five talents went off and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been, um, you have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have, I would have received what was mine own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the other, other outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Maybe, may we hear wisdom for today from this story in our faith tradition. May only the truth be spoken, and only the truth heard. Amen. Well, I may as well be honest and uh, tell you right from the very start that I don't know where we're going today with the parable of the talents. It's a kind of a thorny story. It doesn't make much sense. It assumes a lot that maybe we shouldn't assume. And I don't think I've ever read a commentary or heard or preached a sermon on this parable that really satisfies me. I may as well talk about my summer holiday this morning or about fall gardening tips instead of talking about this parable. At least you might have walked away with something solid to mull over. And by all means, if you go over your grocery list or pay your online bills during this time, then you have my permission. I don't think you'll miss very much this morning, and I'll call you back when we're ready to sing the next hymn. The thing about the parable of the talents is that it has a rather nasty ending as my daughter would say. A rich master gives his servants some money, distributing various amounts among them, and then he leaves. They do the best they can with it, each according to his own ability, and then when the master returns, and they are all forced to render an accounting of what they've done with his money, the master goes berserk beating up on the poor little one-talent guy. The master doesn't sound very nice. Now, a lot of sermons will dance around the master's anger and ferocity and quickly zero in on something else in the parable. 
They'll say that this story is about how we're to use our talents, taking what God has given us and making the best of it. To be honest, I've preached that sermon myself. It works quite well, especially at this time of the year when many churches are trying to balance this year's finances. Make sure you send some of those talents our way, we hear the church saying. And that's certainly one common interpretation of what's going on here. But why did the master get so angry? Maybe my problem is that I probably most identify with that third servant who bore the brunt of so much of the master's wrath. After all, few of us are two or three talent people. Most of us are lucky to have one really good talent, like knitting or computer technology or skating or algebra, let alone having two or more. Few of us could boast of such an embarrassment of talents. One talent in the grand scheme of things is enough, and so I feel an affinity with that one talent servant. And certainly in the story, he comes across as overly cautious. He didn't go out and wheel and deal like the other servants, and therefore didn't get the spectacular returns on his investment. The many talented people did better. But in his defense, he does only have one talent. And when you only have one talent... You just can't go out and take risks. And there's another common interpretation of this parable. It's about taking risks. The first two servants are commended for taking risks and investing their talents, which results in a phenomenal rate of return, 100%. They double it all. And the third servant is clearly condemned for being timid, risk-averse, cowardly. If only he had taken the risk instead of burying his talent in the ground, maybe he too would have been praised by his master. Shouldn't that little guy have a little bit more faith? Well, maybe. But the thing about risk is that it's risky. What would this parable be if the first two servants had taken the risk but failed? It's great that they took the risk and succeeded, but we all know that there's no guarantee when it comes to investing in anything. What if they had lost it all? Can you imagine what the master might say then? Suddenly, that third servant who buried everything in the ground is looking like a Bay Street economist, smart and wise and prudent. So forgive me if in listening to Jesus' story of the talents, I most closely identify with the one talent servant. And forgive me if I wince at the end of the story when the master returns and lowers the boom on that cautious servant. I could imagine that the master might have accused this little man of using some poor investment strategies, of lacking a certain sense of adventure when it came to his finances. But the master goes beyond this. His reaction and the way he beats up on the little guy with one talent seem extreme. So let's take a look at that master in the parable. It's interesting that the story begins at the initiative of the master, who out of the blue calls in his servants and drops upon them a huge amount of money. That's probably escaped you because none of us 
know what a talent was back in Bible times. How much money is a talent? That's a good question. According to the experts, a talent was the equivalent of five years' wages, which means two talents are over a decade's worth of earnings. What would you do if, out of the blue, someone dropped on you ten years' worth of wages? Well, apparently in Jesus' day, the Jewish law stated that the safest thing to do if someone entrusts their property to you is to bury it. In other words, that's exactly what the one talent servant did. He acted responsibly. So why wasn't the master more impressed with this servant's actions? When the master returns, he not only yells at the third servant for being so careful, but unlike his response to the other servants, he rips his pitiful one talent from his hands and gives it to the others. And then Jesus says, it's surely, probably, one of the most bizarre statements in all of the New Testament, he says this, for, all, for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer, is how we might say it today. But no matter how it's expressed, it's what the Bible generally fights against with every fiber of its being. How strange this parable is. But maybe the extreme anger of the master at the end needs to be read in light of the extreme behavior of the master at the beginning. Maybe I'm too horrified by the anger at the end, but not equally as shocked by the extreme behavior at the beginning. For it is, Jesus says, as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. So stop and think about that. That's some kind of master. And that's some kind of slave. The master calls in these slaves and gives them everything he's got the keys to the Mercedes, access to the wine cellar, his PIN number for his bank card, and eight decades worth of wages, more money than you or I will ever make in our lifetime. And I wonder if we can make even another interpretation of what's going on here because this story is told by Jesus. And here, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, we're just one or two chapters away from Jesus' death. On the way to the cross, Jesus tells a story about a master who gave everything he had. And isn't that exactly what Jesus is going to do? Maybe that puts the master's anger in context. I know a number of uh, Filipinos, and maybe you do too. I've met some here in Portage, and several have actually been co-workers with me in the jails where I've worked in, at Agassiz Youth Center and at the Women's Correctional Center. The more you get to know them, the more you realize how connected they are to their family back home. Back home, their families worked hard to get them to Canada, really hard. They did menial jobs, more than one, to get them on their way. The farmer 
sold as cows to pay for his children's education. The teacher worked in a grocery store after hours to provide an opportunity for her children. They scrimped and saved. And they were willing to say goodbye to them, to send them off to a vast country far away, and possibly never even see them again, all for a chance at a better life. In many senses, they gave them everything, just like the master in the parable. And now that their sons and daughters are in Canada, they feel an obligation to return something to their parents back home. Money every paycheck, for example. Money for a new phone. Money for the dentist. I was talking to one a few months ago who was sending money back home to pay for a kidney. The amount of money entering the Philippines every year from overseas workers is in the billions, and not even a pandemic could slow it down. And then, unique to Filipinos, I think, is something called a balakbayan. It's a big box, a huge box, that sits in the living room or in the basement or in a bedroom, and gradually over time they fill it with things from Canada. Anything and everything you can think of, towels and shoes and shirts and underwear and chocolate and bubble bath and sheets, absolutely anything and everything. And when the box is full, and it could take a few months to get that box full, they seal it up and they take it into Winnipeg and they ship it back home. It will take, again, another several months, maybe up to six months for that box to reach the Philippines. I remember asking one of them, don't they have this stuff in the Philippines? Don't they have sheets and towels and chocolate? And of course they do. The answer was yes, of course. But it means more if it comes from them. And if they don't send it, the family back home is deeply confused deeply di disappointed, deeply hurt, maybe even angry, just like the master in the parable. Is it too much to place this custom alongside today's parable? The parents, a thousand miles away, give everything they have for their children. And the children, in return, give everything they have to their parents. A big investment should produce a big return. Today, perhaps the best we can do is to lump this parable into the big picture of all of Jesus' teachings and let it sit there and let it settle into our spirits as part of the whole of Scripture. At times like this, I often think of that invitation to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. May we indeed take time to hear, to reflect on the work of the Spirit, and to respond to the call of the church to live by faith. Thanks be to God. Amen.